Hey everybody, I'm Natasha Viener. I'm the historical architect with uh, the State Historic Preservation Office. Um, and welcome to the 41st Annual Statewide Historic Preservation Conference. And this session, Strange Bedfellows, Sustainability, Climate Change, and New Collaborations. Um, I'll be serving as the moderator for this session. Um, some housekeeping items quick up front. If you experience any technical issues, please use the private chat function to send me a message. Um, and then we'll be able, hopefully be able to handle that. Um, the session is being recorded and will be available for on-demand viewing. As a registrant for this, uh, uh, this session, you will be automatically receive uh, access to the recording after the session. I believe we'll also have them on our website as well later. Uh, we've set aside some time for uh, questions at the end of the session, and we'll get to questions as time allows. But to ask a question, please use the Q&A function of the chat rather than just the regular chat, and make sure you direct it to everyone so that we can all see the questions rather than just one of the presenters. Um, and that way we'll make sure to get to everyone's questions. But first, um, I'd like to uh, begin um, that we want to recognize that the Minnesota history spans at least 13,000 years. The vast majority of that time is represented by American Indian history alone. And for that perspective, our urban and rural built environments are very recent. The state of Minnesota, as it's been known since 1858, is within the ancestral homelands of the Dakota and Ojibwe peoples. The 11 tribal nations in Minnesota are our partners in advance in advocating for recognition and protection of the state's cultural resources, along with other native nations with historical connections here. The State Historic Preservation Office is currently in the final stages of completing our statewide historic preservation plan for the next decade. Among other goals, we seek to broaden the scope and equity of historic preservation through identification and historic designation of more properties important to tribes and un underrepresented communities, including traditional cultural properties, cultural landscapes, archaeological sites, and buildings and structures. We encourage you to be part of this effort and work with us and others to build partnerships and advance historic preservation efforts across the state. Now, um, I'd like to begin um, uh, our presentation. So our, introduce our presenters. We'll, uh, Heidi Swank, uh, who is the director, director, executive director of Rethos, will be speaking with us, as is Riley Gage, who is Rethos's policy associate. She advocates for preservation of sustainably related legislation at the state and national levels. Natalie Hagenen, um, was not able to join us today. Um, she's Rethos's education manager, but Riley will be able to present all of her materials, so we won't be missing out on anything. Um, if you'd like to learn more about their professional backgrounds, you can find their detailed bios and contact information on Min Shippo's conference homepage. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Heidi. Thank you, Natasha. I appreciate it. And welcome, everybody, to um, today's presentation. As Natasha said, uh, Natalie, unfortunately, wouldn't, wasn't able to be here today, but she did put all of her stuff together. So Riley is going to give both Natalie's and her presentation. They'll be first, the first two, and then I will um, close it out at the end. Um, and please do put um, questions in the Q&A. Um, if they're for a specific person, um, please note that in your question also. And with that, I will hand things over to Riley Gage. Thanks, Heidi. So, so we're going to start off talking about deconstruction, and this is um, was Natalie's original presentation, which I'll be presenting for her. Um, so, developing deconstruction, preserving materials, and reducing waste. So, it might be odd to talk about taking down old buildings at a preservation conference, but the reality is that historic buildings come down every day. Um, while we all support rehab and preservation first, preservationists can advocate for careful, thoughtful deconstructing of buildings when removal is unavoidable. So what is deconstruction? Deconstruction is the process of carefully dismantling a building or a portion of a building to salvage materials for reuse. This graphic illustrates our current model of construction and demolition. 
We extract virgin materials, consume energy to construct and use buildings, and then we generate waste once a building is deemed no longer useful. Deconstruction is an old tradition and it stands in contrast to modern day mechanical demolition, which uses heavy machinery to destroy a building quickly and renders most of the materials useless. It also generates harmful air pollution for surrounding neighbors. Deconstruction diverts waste from landfills and reduces our reliance on extracting natural resources and manufacturing new parts. Deconstruction offers an opportunity to salvage quality material, significantly reduce waste and unhealthy pollutants, and shift to a circular economy where materials that are already in use stay in use. I'll throw some numbers at you to underscore how important the built environment sustainability is. In 2018, the EPA calculated that the United States produced 600 million tons of construction and demolition waste. That's more than twice the amount of generated municipal solid waste or everyday trash. Of that 600 million tons, more than 90% comes from demolition of buildings. A 2012 study by the Brookings Institute estimated that 82 billion square feet of existing buildings would be demolished and replaced between 2005 and 2030. That's about a third of our built environment. Imagine a third of your block or your neighborhood being torn down and replaced with new construction. Not only are we causing environmental harm by sending all the material to landfills and incinerators, but we're consuming energy to produce new buildings in the place of old ones. The problem is bigger than our proclivity to throw things away. The real issue lies in what we're throwing away. In a typical demolition project in the Twin Cities, about 85% of those materials could be reused or recycled. We're talking about wood that can be refinished or repurposed, toilets and sinks and cabinets that all still have life left in them, floors that just need a good sanding, hardware that just needs a polish. As preservationists, we can easily see that these materials have historic or aesthetic value, but they also have significant economic and environmental value. These materials have something called embodied energy, the energy associated with the sourcing and creation of a product. By keeping building materials out of the landfills and reusing them, we are literally saving energy. A good example of this, which I'll discuss in more detail later on, is the lumber industry. There's a vast amount of embodied energy in the wood and older homes that's often sent to the landfill when a house is demolished. As a result of this practice, we've been sourcing lower quality wood to construct our homes. By changing our habits towards preserving this embodied energy, we can improve the quality of our new construction and renovations, as well as reduce our reliance on new materials. Deconstruction can be and already is a friend to preservation. Although we prioritize preserving whole buildings in place, demolition still happens. It happens to high profile historic buildings even after a coordinated effort to save it. It also happens to everyday buildings, average homes and nondescript structures that haven't caught preservationist eyes yet. This isn't because they're without value. In all these cases, deconstruction can capture important stories and can generate usable material for other preservation projects. Our building owners, old building owners, often need historic or salvaged material to make repairs. Many historic tax credit projects require in kind repairs, and salvaged materials from buildings of similar eras or similar styles can fill this need. Reusing building components can generate a supply of period appropriate and higher quality materials. Like an organ donor, a building's components, its old growth wood, brickwork, windows, and fixtures can give life to another building, often for a fraction of the cost of new replica materials. And I wanna talk a little bit about old growth wood. It's hard to come by and it can't be found on the shelves at Home Depot or Menards anymore. Old growth wood is lumber that was grown naturally in virgin forests. These trees grew very slowly, resulting in tight growth rings, 
which gives the wood big benefits over second growth and new growth wood. The issue is that the forests in which these trees grew have almost entirely been cut down. Our answer to the dwindling lumber supply and increasing demand has been to plant tree farms. The growing conditions at these farms are vastly different from the forests that the old growth trees grew in, resulting in very fast growing trees. This is great for the lumber industry as they can harvest trees after just 10 to 20 years of growth, whereas the same old growth tree would, would have taken two to 300 years to grow. Because of its tighter structure, old growth wood is more rot resistant, more stable, stronger, and more termite resistant. Because of its scarcity today, old growth wood from older homes is extremely valuable. Most older homes still have original woodwork because of its durability. Through the demolition process, much of this wood ends up in landfills. Deconstruction of older buildings can save this older wood to be used in new buildings or renovation of older buildings. Thoughtful deconstruction also offers the opportunity for detailed documentation of historic building methods and materials. With our current system of mechanical demolition, we lose the chance to learn from historic buildings. Though we cannot preserve every place, we can capture a place's story before it's gone. The nonprofit Repurpose Savannah, located in Savannah, Georgia, offers an example of how to do this well. Their work combines heritage and sustainability in a unique formula. Repurpose Savannah's all-female crew deconstructs buildings that are slated to be torn down anyway, and they document the full history of every project. They study the craft heritage of the place, understanding how the building was constructed, who built it, and what materials and tools were used. They also learn the social and cultural context of the building, and they keep the histories in a digital archive. This is particularly significant because many places prone to demolition and development are lower income BIPOC communities. Instead of sending communities built histories to the trash, we can collect, document, and share these stories. This approach emphasizes the heritage value in salvaged materials. Not only do materials convey information about traditional construction methods that can inform proper rehabilitation, they can also capture stories of people who, whose beloved places no longer exist. So how can preservationists promote deconstruction as a viable demolition alternative? In Portland, Oregon, preservationists got involved after the city created a deconstruction ordinance. The original ordinance stipulated that if a building slated for demolition was more than 100 years old, it had to be deconstructed instead. Preservationists encouraged the city to change the year built guidelines and now any building constructed before 1945 must be deconstructed instead of demolished. The ordinance has reduced applications for demolitions across the city. San Antonio's Office of Historic Preservation has hosted deconstruction training for contractors and they just completed a feasibility study about citywide deconstruction. Preservation Connecticut has created a model deconstruction ordinance. Other preservation nonprofits run salvage shops selling affordable reused materials to their communities. In Minnesota, we have more demand for deconstruction than professionals who can do it. Rethos is exploring contractor training to help fill this gap. We are an active member of Reuse Minnesota and Build Reuse, organizations committed to promoting reuse and deconstruction. We have partnered with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, Hennepin County, and Ramsey County to create and host a class all about deconstruction and salvage. This course teaches homeowners and real estate agents about the possibilities for reuse, particularly in small-scale residential renovations where there is great opportunity for reducing waste. Our involvement in groups of built environment sustainability stakeholders means that preservation has a voice in broader conversations about waste reduction. We've been able to promote full building reuse wherever possible and share the language of preservation with other reuse advocates. When a building must be removed or taken down after rehabilitation alternatives have been considered, 
preservationists have the expertise and the responsibility to promote deconstruction instead. Now I'm going to transition to my portion of the presentation. Um, so I'm going to be talking about green buildings and historic preservation. Um, just a little bit about my background. Um, I have an education in the sciences, um, specifically in environmental science and sustainability. I came to the historic preservation field about a year ago, um, so I'm still very much getting my feet wet. Um, I've taken a particular interest in how older buildings can be retrofitted to reduce their energy use and be competitive with what we tend to think of when we hear green building. So when I started out in this field last year, I admittedly didn't know much about historic preservation. I grew up in New England, so when I think of historic buildings, I think of places like the Trinity Church and the Paul Revere House, both in Boston, and the mansions in Newport, Rhode Island. As a St. Paulite now, I'd be remiss if I didn't include the Cathedral of St. Paul in the list. And while these are all great examples of historic buildings, there are so many more that are less glamorous, but equally as important. And when we talk about green buildings, these are the types of buildings that most people think about. On the top left, we have the New Balance World Headquarters in Boston. Built just a few years ago, the building achieved LEED Platinum certification. In addition to the 80 points needed for that certification, New Balance also acquired all the additional regional priority and innovation points as well as attained all possible credits within the indoor environmental quality category. On the top right, we have the Vancouver Convention Center, a double LEED certified platinum building. Besides adhering to the best energy efficiency standards available, they also work to align with the latest standards as those become available. And it might be hard to tell what the building on the bottom left is, but that's the Facebook headquarters in Menlo Park, California. The sprawling complex is LEED Platinum certified and has all of its energy needs met through a 3.6 megawatt on-site rooftop solar panels. Um, they also have a lot of other cool sustainability features. Um, if you look them up, it's, it's quite a campus. Um, and lastly, the building on the bottom right is the Crystal, an events venue in London. The LEED Platinum Certified Building only uses renewable energy to power its operations and is 90% water self-sufficient. So I've given a LEED rating for all the buildings on the previous slide. Um, I think most of us have probably seen the LEED plaque on the outside of buildings before, um, whether we realized what it was or not. But LEED stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. The LEED Green Building Rating System was started in 1998 by the U.S. Green Building Council. The LEED program has evolved over the past two decades to be more robust and inclusive of all building types. In its current version, there are different rating systems depending on what type of project you're working on. There are rating systems for new construction, existing buildings, and even entire cities. Projects are awarded points based on how many efficiency measures they achieve, and the sum of those points result in a lead rating, with platinum being the highest possible. Until recently, preservationists and green builders have been on a bit of a collision course. I'm sure most of us have seen old buildings be demolished to make room for new buildings. This trend is especially prevalent in cities, where apartment complexes are being put up where there used to be single and multifamily houses. I'm watching this happen in my own neighborhood in St. Paul. I went for a run just yesterday and ran by a house in my neighborhood in the beginning stages of being demolished. Outside the house are fences with banners showing the future development and it's going to become some multi-unit apartment complex. Um, the misconception that old buildings stand in the way of a greener future couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, we've learned that it's generally more sustainable to retrofit old buildings rather than demolish them and build something new. One of the biggest challenges is figuring out how to navigate restrictions that may be placed on older buildings. The Nas National Register doesn't restrict a property owner from altering the building, 
but significant modifications may result in the removal from the register. There are also additional restrictions if state or federal funds are used in the modifications. Despite these challenges, over the past decade, there have been some notable successes in greening historic buildings. It often takes a bit of ingenuity and thinking outside the box to make these buildings more efficient. My first example is the Empire State Building in New York City. In 2011, a $550 million Empire State rebuilding program was completed. As a result of the project, the Empire State Building is now LEED certified gold as well as Energy Star certified. It's one of only a few national landmarks to receive LEED certification and is one of the tallest. Um, it was beat out by Taipei 101 in Taiwan uh, a few years after its certification. Um, the team that implemented the retrofits made the entire design public so that modifications can be replicated at other properties. Uh, the improvements made to the building uh, reduced energy consumption by 38% and saves over $4 million in energy costs each year. The improvements reduced carbon emissions by an estimated 105,000 metric tons over 15 years. Next up, we have the U.S. Treasury Building in Washington, D.C. This building also got its LEED Gold certification in 2011. It was a big federal investment during the recession, but the savings speak for themselves. The estimated three and a half million dollars in savings each year stem from a 43% decrease in potable water usage, a 7% decrease in electricity usage, a 53% reduction in steam usage, and reduced need for lease space by increasing the number of workstations in the building. Moving on to some smaller buildings, we have the Balfour Guthrie Building in Portland, Oregon. Built in 1913, it was part of the westward expansion of Portland in the 1910s. The building housed the Balfour Guthrie Company until 1978, when the City Rubber Stamp Company moved in. In 2002, hacker architects moved into the building and planned a major overhaul to suit their needs and preferences. As a result of the renovations, the building achieved LEED Silver Certification in 2003. Some of the improvements included a zoned HVAC system, motion sensing lights that dim according to the amount of available natural light, energy star appliances throughout the building, and low flow fixtures and toilets to reduce water usage. Built in 1807, the Fay House at Harvard University is one of the older buildings to be LEED certified. In fact, at the time of its certification, it was the oldest. The building was initially built as a private residence, but was purchased by Harvard in the late 19th century to serve as the main building for Radcliffe College, one of the seven sisters colleges in the Northeast. Today, the building is the administrative building for the Radcliffe Institute. The renovation of the building began in summer 2011 and was completed the following spring. Renovations included improvements to the mechanical and electrical systems, structural improvements, increased energy efficiency, and improved indoor air quality. Of note, 39% of the project's total materials cost was provided by salvaged, refurbished, or reused materials, and 97% of the project's construction and demolition debris was diverted from the landfill. The oldest LEED certified building in the world, excuse my pronunciation, is Seed Central, headquarters for Cafoscari University in Venice, um, at 568 years old. The building achieved its initial certification in 2013 and later received silver certification in 2018. The building was certified based on improvements to water efficiency, energy savings, sustainable cleaner products, sustainable transportation options to and from the building, waste management, and green procurement of consumer goods and durable goods. This building is really a testament to the possibilities for bringing historic buildings into the 21st century. If a Venetian Gothic Palazzo can achieve these sustainability goals, the 50-year-old house down the street from you almost can certainly meet them too. 
Clearly from the last few slides, we can see that it's more than just possible to retrofit old buildings to make them more efficient and competitive with some of the greenest buildings being constructed today. The challenge we're facing is convincing the rest of the world of that. There are some larger issues at hand that I think are preventing older buildings from reaching their full potential as energy efficient structures. As we discussed before, many single family homes are torn down and replaced with multi unit structures. This is a tough trend to combat unless cities enact demolition bans or limits, such as the one that was recently passed in Portland. Federal and state tax credits do provide some incentive for developers to renovate existing buildings, such as warehouses or vacant commercial buildings into apartment complexes. By focusing our efforts on repurposing the buildings we already have, we can reduce the amount of material that ends up in landfills and create more sustainable historic buildings. We should also consider the inherent sustainability of older homes. Historic buildings were traditionally designed with sustainable features that responded well to climate. Some examples of passive design features in these buildings are the orientation of the building itself, overhangs, strategically planned, planted shade trees, and durable material use. And though this presentation is focused mainly on LEED certified buildings, there are plenty of other organizations that analyze and monitor building community sustainability. The Green Star Certification is an Australian program along the same lines as LEED, which uses impact categories to assign points to projects based on their goal achievement. Energy Star is commonly known for home appliances, but it extends to commercial buildings and homes as well. Enterprise Green Communities is a relatively new program designed for green affordable housing construction. Currently, 27 states require that affordable housing developments receiving public funds comply with the Green Communities criteria. Green Step Cities is a recognition program to help Minnesota cities achieve their sustainable goals. If you're in a Minnesota city, you should see if your city or town is participating in Green Step. Um, Rethos is a partner in Green Step Cities, um, full disclosure, um, but it's neat to see sort of what your community is doing um, and the progress they're making towards sustainability goals. Thanks, Riley. Okay, so with that, I will um, pick it up from here and talk a bit about um, wildfire. So my paper is, um, my talk is entitled Wildfire Collaborations, Making New Friends to Save Historic Landscapes. You can advance the slide. So before I start, just a little bit about me and why it is you're looking out not at a place that's not Minnesota. Um, so I have recently uh, moved to Minnesota from Nevada, um, where I lived for the last 15 years and served four terms in the Nevada legislature and also um, started Nevada's statewide historic preservation nonprofit. Um, during my uh, terms in the Nevada legislature, I chaired the Committee on Natural Resources, the Committee on Public Lands, and I created and chaired the Interim Committee on Wildfire. Um, and so from that perspective, from that, that job, I could come to um, these issues around the sagebrush sea and wildfire, but also as a historic preservationist, um, my nonprofit, we worked quite a bit on issues around the sagebrush sea. So if you're not familiar, um, oh wait, sorry, one more note before I go forward is I'm gonna talk a little, a lot about Nevada here. Um, but I think for a lot of us in the United States, we should be looking at Nevada uh, because as the driest state in the nation, it's really at the forefront of how climate change is going to eventually impact all of us. Um, a lot of the water issues that you've heard about with the Colorado River um, increases in temperature, which we here in Minnesota just experienced this summer and the and also in Nevada experienced an extremely hot and dry um, summer this year and many years previous to that. So I think that for a lot of the country, what's happening in Nevada may or may not happen other places um, if climate change continues to progress in the direction it is. 
So starting off here and talk a bit about the Sagebrush Sea. If you're not familiar with this, um, this is an area in Northern Nevada and um, into that, that whole um, Great Basin biome area. Um, it used to be a lot larger. Um, it literally was just a, a massive sea of sagebrush. And since European settlement, the, the area that's covered by sagebrush has reduced by at least 50%. And this isn't due to many, uh, many causes. Um, of course, agriculture, the creation of roads, um, putting in fences, urban sprawl, mining, power lines, and also invasive grasses, which I'll talk about in a bit, a bit more. This kind of funny looking bird that I have a lot of uh, affection for at the bottom is the greater sage grouse. Um, and it, um, it teeters on the edge of um, in the endangered status a lot. Um, most recently, um, it was doing pretty well until the Martin fire in 2018, and now it's back on kind of teetering. Um, so the greater sage grouse has its population um, has reduced by 56% since European settlement. And the range wide abundance has reduced by 93%. That means that, that they're being clustered in smaller areas. And the reason why I bring up the greater sage grouse is that it is the lead indicator for the health of the sagebrush sea because these animals use the cover of the sagebrush as migration corridors. So when they lose their migration corridors, their numbers drop too. So they're just a really easy way to. Um, Mark that health. Uh, next slide, please. So, with this idea um, in, in mind about wildfires and um, what's happening as far as this very this historic landscape of the Sagebrush Sea, um, this is tracking the growth of wildfires across the entire country since 1983 when we decided that we needed to. Um, have healthy fires and not just do fire suppression as we had been doing for quite some time. So if you can kind of just go over the, it's the far right, um, the acres column that I think is the most interesting as you progress between 1983 and 2020. And you can see a general trend uh, toward much larger fires. The number of fires maybe not as increased, but the, the um, area that they cover that they burn definitely has increased um, since the early 1980s. And this is a trend that, that we see again nationwide. Next, next uh, slide. So we all have heard about the wildfires in the American West. I think these are pictures from California, uh, many of them from the, the terrible campfire but also the fires that have happened this year. And I think the, this is something that the that we see a lot of in the news. Um, it impacts a lot of homes. It impacts people's lives. Uh, it in, also impacts their livelihoods and um, has definitely caused um, a lot of folks um, to move out of California, especially Northern California. We've seen in Nevada and move into Nevada. So. Um, definitely been a huge impact. And this, I think um, it's definitely changed over the last decade and become a much bigger problem than it has been previously. Next slide. So um, this is looking at the Great Basin biome. So the Great Basin, is, it's mainly in Nevada, but parts kind of north and a little bit into California. And here we can see some additional photos of wildfires. And if you think back to the pictures on the previous slide, uh, you saw homes, you saw people. Um, one of the things that um, is um, important about the, the fires in the Great Basin is that they are in places that people are not. They tend to be um, harder to find. Uh, the first 24 hours of a fire is the key um, to getting into one of these fires, but the, after you get past 24 hours, it gets very difficult to keep it um, in as a smaller fire. It tends to run after those first 24 hours. But as you can see, for some of these places are so remote, 
that um, it takes quite a while before anyone will notice that there is that there is a fire and it's usually past that 24 hour mark. Next slide. And so one of the the challenges that comes with with the um, with these fires is ones that are in these remote areas is trying to find ways to rehabilitate these communities. And so um, this is one of the things that I found very surprising as I uh, was working on wildfires um, in Nevada is that there are some FEMA thresholds that that um, leave places that are remote with a very um, a big hill to climb as far as um, um, getting assistance. So here we can see um, the the requirements, the criteria that FEMA has in order to give grants. And these, as it says here, um, repay 75% of state costs for suppression of large fires. So there has to be a threat to lives in property that include especially critical infrastructure and watersheds, um, the availability of state and local firefighting resources. So in this criteria, this is one of the criteria that um, uh, fits better for these remote fires that we see. Um, high fire danger conditions and the potential for major economic impact. So one of the issues we see is that when you have a remote fire, um, you just you don't burn homes don't burn businesses don't burn there's not that clear major economic impact um some friends of mine at the department of wildlife would joke that maybe they needed to go and find some old some old trailers and put them out into the public land so if there was a fire we could meet the fema thresholds um, there's a threshold of a million dollars of damage that has to be, has to incur before you can get uh, FEMA money. So if you look at these two fires at the bottom on the left is the Martin fire. This occurred mainly in Nevada um, in 2018 and covered 436,000 acres. And on the right was the Camp Fire, which was much smaller, but had a much greater human impact. And those human impacts are really what are covered by FEMA. So even though the Martin fire, 99% of the Martin fire was uh, burned sage grouse habitat and the sagebrush sea. There still was very little federal money that went into um, uh, costs for rehabilitation and replanting of the, of the sagebrush sea, as well as um, providing assistance in um, helping out with the wildlife and rehabilitation of wildlife. Uh, so there are definitely these issues um, that have we've come up against in these remote areas uh, when it comes to getting FEMA assistance. Uh, next slide. So a little bit more about um, kind of wildfire and looking at Nevada. Um, uh, just I think that it, this will help kind of explain why it is that we have so many more fires happening right now. So the map you see on the right the darker the colors of um, areas that are marked are the are the early, are the later the more recent fires that have happened, and as you can see in that north and off to the northeast in um, Nevada, it's repetitive fires. There's a, a city up there called Elko that is eternally every summer it is it is in smoke and and has fires. And if you look at the histogram on the left, you can see the number of acres burned by wildfire in Nevada between 80 and, 99, and 1999, it was 4.2 million acres, and then it jumped up to 9.5 million acres. And there are a lot of reasons for this. And there are kind of a, a bunch of uh, things that kind of come together. One is that we have a warming planet that's creating drier areas at higher and higher altitudes. So we are seeing, um, it used to be just wildfires on the grasslands, and now they're going up into the mountains too, because those areas are becoming increasingly drier. But one other piece is that in the Great Basin, around the turn of the last century, a grass called cheatgrass was introduced into the environment uh, with, um, it was billed as being great for, um, for grazing. Turns out it's grazable for like eight weeks out of the year and that's it. Um, the rest of the time it is extremely dry 
and become and and is and starts on fire much more much more easily than the sagebrush. Now, one other thing about sagebrush, about cheatgrass, is that it returns to a burn area much faster than the sagebrush can grow in. So it comes in if there is a fire, then it comes in, it takes over the area, and then it dries out. And by midsummer, it's pretty dry, and then it burns again. And so this is causing um, fires to happen more and more frequently where we have already lost um, sagebrush and especially in places where you have a cheatgrass monoculture and it has totally pushed out the sagebrush. So we are getting um, an increasing number of fires, but also expanding those fires out into other areas. Uh, next slide. So in 2017 and 2018 were particularly bad years in Nevada for a wildfire. Um, in uh, 2017 nationwide, there were more than 10 million acres that burned um, and 1.3 million of those acres were in Nevada alone. In 2018, there were 8.7 million acres of, of um, grassland that burned or land that burned and more than a million acres of that was in Nevada alone. In addition, if you look at the 10 um, Western states in each of these years in 2017 and in 2018, more um, acres burned in Nevada than all of the other nine states combined each of these years. So the work that I started doing came after these two really bad fire years in Nevada and was work that I started in 2019, which was um, my last um, session in the Nevada legislature. Um, and it really, people were really starting to become extremely worried in Nevada about the impacts of climate change on um, our environment and the increasing wildfires. I should also note that um, ranching is a pretty big part of the Nevada economy, and most of that ranching happens on public lands. Nevada has 86% um, of the state is owned by the federal government. So it is mostly a vastly majority public land state, and the, that land um, is used a lot by ranchers who are given permits to graze um, on, um, on the public lands. So there is some that that started to get a lot of the ranchers in Nevada. This this succession of two years of massive wildfires, um, very worried about their um, about their um, livelihoods going forward. So next slide. So I'm going to go try to go through these a little bit quickly. Um, just what I what I did at the le legislature was get bring together. Um, several members of the state legislature, as well as um, state agencies, and then Nevada Preservation as the advocacy organization to really start to think about how it was that we were going to work on long-term planning for wildfires. At that point, Nevada really had just been literally fighting the fire in front of them and not being able to do a lot of long-term planning. So we sat down and it was the heads of these of these departments and really started to think through what was needed. And um, what we did is we started to build this collaboration that was an empty room during the legislative session where we could all sit down and talk through things. So it started off with the Department of Agriculture, Wildlife, and the Division of Forestry and the Department of Natural Resources, members of the state legislature, just a few of us, both urban and rural, who were worried about the, the welfare issue. And then I said, as I said, Nevada Preservation. Next slide. But as I learned throughout this whole process, there are so many people that come into the whole fire issue that it, it was a little bit unwieldy as we went through this um, period of trying to find ways to get organized, but there was no way that we could eliminate any piece of these people of these these organizations. So the next group that we brought in that this first original core of stakeholders brought in was we started to talk with the US Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management, and then the local fire associations. 
Um, and one of the things that we learned is that they had a really great way of communicating between them. They shared resources, they knew each other. These folks all had a great relationship together and they had, they had that um, collaboration going. Next slide. But now these folks didn't necessarily always hear what was happening. So here we're adding in the federal delegation, the governor, and then also the Department of Transportation. Um, it really depended on if you had a governor who was going to listen. And at first we didn't have a governor that was going to listen. Um, if you look at news now, he's very much listening, which is great in Nevada. The federal delegation got on board pretty quickly. Um, Senator Cortez Masto has been just an amazing partner in trying to um, deal with Nevada's um, wildfire issues. And the Department of Transportation kind of came up late. We didn't really think about them. And I think that was one thing that um, I wish we'd involved them earlier because they um, have all of the easements along the highways and they maintain all of those um, areas along the highways and ensure that they don't, that those basically become fire breaks, that they don't let the brush grow right up to the highways. Next slide. And then we also brought in local governments and county governments. And here is where we really learned that there was a communication breakdown, that the state and the federal levels were talking to each other, but they weren't involving the local and the county governments. And those were a lot of the on the ground firefighting that was happening and that there just wasn't a great way that they were communicating. And so we started to build those collaborations. Next slide. And this just adds in one down at the lower left that kind of came up later that ended up being pretty important was that all of our out of state partners that come in when we have a huge fire like the Martin fire that was almost half a million acres. You bring in people um, from other states who don't understand your environment um, to a lot of people. They would go out to rural Nevada in the in the desert and. And it would not, it would look like a, a blank slate to them. It would look like nothing to them, and they would create fire breaks in the middle of sage grouse habitat. And so we were working on ways to increase um, easy forms of communication when we had to bring in out of state partners at the last minute. Next slide. So out of all of the bringing all of these people together, we really, I think the biggest thing we did that worked really well was having these informal meetings of core stakeholders. We didn't have legislators sitting on a dais asking people questions. We used an empty committee room. Everybody just pulled up a chair and we brought in folks to talk to us about what their issues were so that we could actually work through them. Um, we identified issues of communication, as I said, between like the state and federal folks and the local folks. There was also a misunderstanding of work distribution of who should be the first, the first people at a fire and who can, who can help out with the fire and who needs to stay away. There have also been recent changes to fire insurance that was not well understood at the county level, but that the state had tried to implement. And so these were a way just to get people to talk to each other and really find those better paths for communication. And out of this um, core meeting of stakeholders, um, we put together a three day retreat of state, federal and local entities to develop a plan for better collaboration. So we met later in the year and spent three days together talking through all of our issues and figuring out what our plan was. And then the result of that was the first shared stewardship agreement signed between state and federal agencies. We're working on, I guess they're still working on that local piece, but we did get to have that shared stewardship agreement was one of was like the first in the nation. Next slide. So I'm talking all about Nevada here, but as I said, Nevada is really just the the or is on the fore of all of the, the fire and climate change and, and the warming of our planet and the impacts there. But we do have a lot of areas that are similar here. So we know we've all experienced um, the smoke this summer from the Boundary Waters fires. And in particular, we currently have the Greenwood fire that is at 27,000 acres and is 
50% contained as of this morning. And this is again a historic landscape. This is a landscape that's part of Minnesota history and, and is something that we need as preservationists to be concerned about its, um, its maintenance. And now again, this is another remote area that FEMA dollars may not be um, as, as much as is needed to help do environmental restoration because of fewer structures and smaller towns. But it's also the backbone of many livelihoods. And for many, it's, you know, there are a lot of organizations that could come together and work on these issues. I think um, one of the great things about the Boundary Waters is that it has a lot of human involvement in it already. And so in that way, you're not trying to, as in Nevada, where these are truly remote areas where nobody is interacting with them, that it's really hard to sometimes get people's attention when you're when you're worried about it about it burning. But I do think here with the Boundary Waters, everyone here understands the importance of this area, um, not only historically but also economically. Um, but I think there are a lot of lessons that we can learn here in Minnesota from places out in the West because we know that bigger fires will be coming. And um, looking to the work that California and Nevada and similar places are doing can help us get further ahead. And next slide. So we're happy to answer any questions you might have if you want to just throw them in the chat. I think Riley, there's one there for Natalie. I'm not sure if you can address that one. Can you read it? I can't see the chat. Yeah. <laughs> How high is demand for salvaged material? Are there stats on this? That's a super good question, and I don't have the stats available to me right now. Um, I know that um, there are organizations working right now to put solid stats together um, to help inform policy makers, um, because I, I think I think the idea in the public is that there isn't a lot of demand, but that that's not true from what we've seen at these reuse shops. I mean, demand is higher than ever with people wanting to redo older buildings or incorporate older materials into new buildings. Um, I can possibly get some stats and send them to you if you want to provide your email address or other contact information. And you can also reach out to Natalie directly, Natalie at refos.org, and she might be able to get that for you, Betty. Any other questions? This is Natasha. I was just want to encourage everybody to throw your questions in the chat. Um, uh, anything that you you want to ask? I, I have a question for you, Heidi. Um, while we're waiting for some questions from the audience, as a as a preservationist, um, I'm, I'm super interested in, in the wildfire question. Of course, partly though from um, uh, uh, cultural, you know, where we would come from directly would be a cultural resource question. And so I'm really interested in how you or Rethos are planning on using your really awesome experience out in um, Nevada and building relationships and how to how you envision doing that in Minnesota or also then bringing in tribes. I mean, I think that large area where the boundary waters is is, is governed by the um, uh, or has involvement from the uh, 1854 Treaty Authority. Um, and so I'm curious how you were planning on on working together here in Minnesota with everyone. That's a good question. And I would say these are early days for me, so I'm not exactly sure. Um, I have been part of um, the National Trust for Historic Preservation and the National Preservation Partners um, Preservation Priorities. Actually, this that just came out today. I'm going to put the website in the chat. Um, that just actually that just went live today at um, it's not letting me send. I'm not sure why I'm not able to send. I don't know. Let me try this one more time. Um, so one of okay, maybe this one. No, it won't let me put anything in the chat. Let me try this. Okay, that's in the chat, not in the Q and A. I can't. I think as a pet, as a presenter, I can't 
enter into the Q&A. Oh, I, I did put a I see preservation priorities in the chat. Though. Yep. So in the chat, this is something that the National Trust has been um, engaging with a bunch of preservationists across the country to work on different priorities. And one of them is um, climate change. And so we just put out an issue paper on um, how we need to deal with a, a whole collection of issues around climate change. I will say one of the things that's been kind of sticking in my head that I feel like would be really useful for preservationists is a handy kind of, especially if you're like have a house museum or um, are just worried about the impacts of wildfire on a historic structure is putting together a one pager um, on how to harden your historic building while maintaining that historic integrity. I think that the, we have some um, some features to our, our to our historic buildings that are encourage fire, and we would like them if we want to try to save them going forward. So it's one of the projects that's kind of on my plate that I'm thinking about as going forward with wild with my wildfire work, um, but also like. I'm hoping that as we go forward to get more involved locally with the tribes and other folks who are interested in um, in in delving more into the wildfire issues, but I have not yet at this point. But it's a, it's on my list of to do things. Yeah, we've had some certainly had some really interesting conversations with the Superior National Forest specifically about the historic buildings out there and looking at different fireproofer materials. And the conflicts that they've run into with historic buildings. I think we found some good options, some from California, which are really interesting. You know, the desire to put on uh, metal roofs immediately onto a historic, and if people don't know that there are fire rated shingles that are, you know, maybe. Right. Um, and that's what I feel like, especially for folks who maybe just have a, a, a house that they own themselves as a private home and don't have a lot of resources. How can mm -hmm. we make this easiest for them? Like, what are some of the the low hanging fruit that would make it very simple for someone to make sure that their their home um, can has a better chance of withstanding a fire coming through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I see uh, Betty. Uh, thanks you for your answer. I think one of the questions I had also was that um, uh, it, it seems like a lot of the times uh, deconstruction or the architects aren't able to use um, or specify. Uh, deconstructed materials and a lot of times has there's there's no um, uh, organized system of keeping track of the materials so they don't know when they specify it they don't know for sure that they're going to be able to have it and that's because their clients are depending upon them to specify a material that will be available of course we're facing supply chain chain problems all over the place right now have you guys thought about working with architects to figure out how to um, Make a specifiable deconstruction because, of course, you can do. Obviously, I think anecdotally there is a lot of demand for reuse items. It would be really awesome to see it get moved into the commercial sector as well. Have you guys have working with architects at all on that area, or I'm not sure if Natalie has been. She has most of the contact with, um, you know, contractors and architects and things like that. Um, I would be interested to see um, now that in Portland they have um, an ordinance for deconstruction. I'm, I'm sure that there must be a system in place to actually organize that um, because I, I don't know of, especially like in the Twin Cities right now, I don't know of any system to kind of like inventory, you know, what is available in a house and what's going to be available after a, a deconstruction. Um, certainly, like that would advance the system as a whole to be able to know like you know i have x amount of hardwood coming out of this house that we're deconstructing that can be used you know for a project but i don't know of any system right now that's in place um but again I i'm sure there's probably something in portland or these other cities that have these ordinances yeah i, I certainly heard of uh, 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 i heard a, a uh, company from baltimore a private company that are Made it their their exclusive job to sell or to salvage and uh, make like something truly boring like flush wood office doors their their job to to um, organize and uh, 
and make it very super easy for people to reuse and make it kind of change the idea. Does anybody see any other questions that we're looking at or other things that you wanted to add? Because I certainly have piles of questions, but I don't want to steal the show. <laughs> It's too bad that, um, uh, uh, not Heidi, I was going to say both of you are confused by your Natalie. <laughs> I should remember another N name. Wouldn't be with us to talk about that. I know the MPCA has been definitely working hard on the deconstruction. So they're great partners. So looks like Christine put something in the chat for Heidi. Okay. Um, so I, I, I started to minimize the chat because I was going to see. Oh, some uh, here's a question about FEMA evaluations. Um, besides, I guess so. Can... So what of long term natural system effects and damage? I'm not sure what the the question is there. Well, I'm wondering um, if she's, is she asking about, um, about trying to bump up the value in order to get that FEMA money or your I mean, I, trailer? Yeah, I know. That's, plans, I, secret it's, you know, and trailer it's, plans. And it's a definitely a, like a problem for small towns in general. So one of the um, projects that I worked on at Nevada Preservation was in a town of about a thousand people that had been um, most of the downtown the historic downtown had been leveled by a, a big earthquake in 2008 and um, the they lost um, all but like one historic building and because the town was so small there was a lot of damage to private homes but those collectively didn't meet the FEMA threshold for assistance so they were unable to get assistance because it was such a small town. And that happens quite frequently for these really tiny communities. And so I think that's these, these minimum thresholds that FEMA puts in place, thinking that a million dollars is an easy threshold, probably needs to be rethought on maybe a per capita basis instead of a flat amount, because it just makes it out of reach for tiny little towns like that. And I think we have those all over the United States. So it looks like Christine kind of uh, clarified her question here. She's asking, um, how do we value natural systems and essentially give them value within the FEMA uh, thing so that it isn't necessarily about, can we, can we try and get FEMA regulations that value cultural resources or endangered animals? Has anyone tried to do something like that or and just get, it, get us past the whole idea of trying to get... I know there are people working on that to try to find a path forward on that for sure. And to my knowledge, that hasn't hasn't succeeded yet. But I know that there are conversations. I feel like in some ways it's also like the the same, you know, these are very slow moving changes. Like we try to make get get some changes to the national register criteria too for the national register. And like these are always very slow moving changes, but there are people who are working on that. Yeah, I'm certainly in, in recent years, we've been definitely trying to include um, cultural and traditional intangible resources in our National Register nominations. It's a lot of work to do. There's such a backlog. I mean, there's so many resources that have gotten listed already, and um, we weren't even paying attention to cultural landscapes before, and now mm -hmm. historic landscapes and all sorts of things. There's so many things to be added and paid attention to, and that includes, of course, all sorts of underrepresented communities. So, and I think at, you know, being sure to take it to add landscapes to um, uh, endangered, you know, most endangered lists are a really great way for people to um, to find some outreach to vol for volunteers and for funders who would like to get involved. A lot of those look at those in you know those most endangered lists, and so keeping that on our radar that we should be nominating you know, places like the boundary waters as endangered due to climate change. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of those types of um, environmental land uh, areas that if they were on, a, on that kind of list would get more attention. Certainly. 
we're just even including, um, yeah, and, and talking about collaborators, preservationists aren't usually used to collaborating with them. Um, habitat folks where you know where some of the cultural resources we see at risk are wild racing areas here in Minnesota or um, moose or other um, people who are very important um, to our communities. And I would say I was surprised at the amount of collaboration I, en I have ended up doing as a preservationist with the Department of Wildlife. Um, like I, the amount of education those folks gave me and all of the things I learned from the Department of Wildlife, you know, like all of the, the ways in which the sage grouse is intertwined with the sagebrush sea and how it, like issues around um, how do we have, how do we get access to seeds and seed storage and all of those pieces that go into putting into restoring a landscape like that mm -hmm. really came out of the Department of Wildlife. So I, I think for me, that was my most surprising collaboration. And the one that I learned, I learned more from, from those folks than from any other single entity that I worked with. Yeah, there's just so much knowledge out there. I know, I think when you said seed saving, um, I'm, a, I'm a crazy seed saver myself. Not necessarily, well, we have a little piece of prairie, but also just, um, historic seeds with vegetable plants and that sort of thing, which I was introduced to at the um, Oliver Kelly Farm um, historic site. And that's a really interesting crossover um, place to go see cultural landscapes and historic landscapes and how, because they've got, they've got prairie and they've got historic farming and all sorts of really cool mm -hmm. things like that. There's so many different ways to engage in preservation and, uh, and, and build people's interest in climate change as well. So, and I know that there are a lot of small businesses out there that are um, trying to um, create seed repositories for post fire rehabilitation. So, I would say that if someone's interested in historic landscapes and is looking for a way to get involved, I know there's a lot of organizations and especially departments of wildlife and departments of natural resources that interact, um, the Bureau of Land Management runs seed repositories across the country. And that is such a, a difficult thing for, because they only last for so long, right? And you'll never have enough seed to get, to come back from a single large fire, but it's just a kind of a start, but it's a really interesting field to look into, to learn about and that, and its piece in, in restoring these historic landscapes. And it's an interesting place to kind of get your feet wet in, um, in that in that whole kind of restoration of these landscapes. That's really cool. Does anybody else have any questions? Um, I know it seems like we haven't been talking about um, lead. Um, in I know lead has made a lot of changes um, in the way they've approached. Uh, historic buildings. Have you, obviously you were showing some earlier examples. It seems like they've made a lot of changes and listened with their kind of different categories lately. And it seems like uh, historic buildings might be able to join more in, in operations lead certification. Are there other ways that you see a more typical way that uh, as a historic building owner could um, engage with lead rather than through a big, huge, crazy big project? Yeah, LEAD has actually done a really great job in trying to be more inclusive with different building types. Um, so you can actually earn, you know, points, which lead you to a certification now just for starting a project in a historic building. Um, just, I think they're finally understanding the challenge of, uh, you know, making modifications to historic buildings and the restrictions that are that are on them that aren't on new buildings. Um, and that's partly why in their rating system, they've broken it into, you know, whether it's a new building or um, one is in operations and management. So um, you can really do a lot of changes without actually affecting the structure of the building just by, um, you know, improving how much water you use and what kind of, you know, electrical systems you use and things like that um, to kind of like level the playing field where like you might not be able to tear down an entire wall to put 
windows in, um, which obviously isn't practical for a historic building. Um, so they've made pretty great strides and I, I think there's still a lot of work to do. Um, that having been said, I, I don't think LEAD is the be all end all. I mean, there are plenty of other organizations that will give you a plaque or give you a certification if that's what you're looking for. Um, I know it's it's nice to it's nice to have that on the side of your building or be able to promote that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think there are, there's a lot more opportunities now than there was when LEAD started. Um, and I mentioned with the Empire State Building when they did all of those renovations, they they made that design public, um, mm -hmm. so you can see how they how they managed to make those improvements. Um, I'm almost pretty sure that that was a historic tax credit project. So it goes to show that you can definitely meet the standards and uh, and make make that happen. Um, and I think now with um, the Department of Commerce was introduced. And I I don't believe it was successful this year, but there was a, it was a great legislative session for climate change, and it was introduced as a goal for Minnesota to reduce energy use of all existing buildings by 50 percent by 2030. Um, and uh, that's a huge, huge reach or stretch, but it, it seems like something we need we need to start working on. And how how can uh, how can have you have your missions expanded? Has Rethos's mission expanded to looking at all existing buildings, or do you think you're going to be focused on um, on how do how do we um, even if you're not meeting you know lead or you're just a homeowner because lead is a it's not an expensive thing to do or a, a, a easy thing to organize, so to speak. And so just because you're not lead rated doesn't mean that you didn't make major efforts. Have you guys been thinking about how to how the historic buildings of the state can can be part of meeting that goal of that 50% reduction by 2030? Or fuel switching? I know I at our, my historic home, as you can see in the background here, we're we're fuel switching. Right now, we've got um, bids in for going all electric. It'll be exciting. So, yeah, I'll let I'll let Heidi speak in depth to that. I would say um, we are definitely interested in looking at the sustainability lens of preservation. Um, and we've definitely got a few folks on board at Rethos that um, are pretty gung ho about about moving forward with that. But I'll, I'll let Heidi speak to future plans. And, and I will say too, we, we're currently going through our strategic planning process that will kind of shape what we're going to be doing in the next five to seven years. But I think a lot of what we already do is trying to help folks um, find the path forward on their house. So a lot of cl classes that Natalie um, coordinates, um, you know, helps with you know reduction in fuel use for by whether stripping windows and reductions in water use by making sure you understand that your plumbing is working correctly. So I think some of the things we're doing are trying to get people to do the, find those easy things that they can do that are not outside of the, um, the range of what a regular person can do without having to worry too much about lead certification for, for your 1950s bungalow. Yeah, because it is a big step, but um, we definitely see that as part of preservation going forward, that um, we all need to be thinking about how we can um, lessen our impact on the planet. Well, it's been, it's it's end of session time. It's been great talking to you guys. I'm sure um, your contact information is obviously up on the screen right now, and um, I'm. Uh, Sure, people will have more questions for you. It's an interesting issue to think over and, and have uh, always more questions come as you think. But I want to let everybody know that, um, as I said at the beginning of the session, we will we have been recording this and um, it will be available to all of the attendees. I will be sending you a link to it, but I believe we'll be posting it on the website. So you can certainly recommend it to everyone. Um, I know the University of Minnesota has already asked for links to our climate change sessions so um, so they can show students and other things like that. Be feel free to share and spread the links around. Is there anything that you wanted to say, uh, Heidi and Riley, before we we take off? No, thank you so much for having us. This was this was great. 
Yeah. Thank you. It was wonderful to have you guys, and I'm sure we'll be talking more in future. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Okay. My computer won't stop now.